Uh, if, you, if you're just listening, the title of this message is Declaration of Victory. Declaration of Victory. Declaration of Independence. Everybody heard Declaration of Independence? Nobody has? Amen. This is Declaration of Victory. Amen. And victory, we're going to find it from Webster's. It says, victory is conquest. It's the defeat of an enemy in battle or an, of an antagonist in contest. A gaining of the superiority in war or combat. Victory supposes the power of an enemy or an antagonist to prove inferior to that of the victor. Victory, however, depends not always on superior skill or valor. It's often gained by the fault or mistake of the vanquished. The advantage or superiority gain over spiritual enemies is also victory. Victory can be over passions, over appetites, over temptations, or in any struggle a competition. Competition. I, I was glancing at the uh, British Open this morning, the golf tournament. I glanced at it for a few minutes to see what the deal was. And this guy is leading uh, about five or six strokes. And if he continues going the way he's going, he's going to be victorious. But, you know, the guys who are trying to catch him, they want to be victorious too. And so they don't have to be better than him to win. All they got to do is be their best. And if he stumbles enough, then someone else will win. And so everybody wants victory. We watch it all the time on TV and tennis and golf and football, basketball, and everything else. Amen? The only sport I think victory doesn't count in is pickleball. I played pickleball for the first time Friday. Amen? I mean, I played golf three times. And then I went and played some pickleball because pickleball is like ping pong and badminton uh, the, t together. And I was pretty good at both of those. I've never been on a pickleball court. But I, it, it's such a friendly environment and, and you get so much good exercise. But it's, it's not really competition because they don't, they don't sell whiff tickets like they do in basketball and golf and stuff. They, they, I mean, everybody is, is kind and friendly and stuff. And, and, Everybody can play. You got people out there every, every age and, you know, old folks. It's old folks really gravitate to that game. Amen. So we should have a serious pickleball <laughs> operation up in here. Amen. We might have a pickleball club started up in here so that we can get some exercise going around up in here. Amen. Because it, 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 can't nobody, Elder Kathy, you can play pickleball, man. Praise God. You might be too strong, though, because you hit that ball too hard to knock people out. But everybody can play some pickleball. <laughs> Amen. And uh, Sister Lorraine, you can play pickleball too because my knees were hurting because I'd been playing golf and they kept, well, some guy kept saying, you got to move your feet. I say, if you knew how my knees felt, you'd be, you'd be shut up. Amen. I'll move my feet when I come back out here fresh. Amen. When I come here fresh, I'm going to shut them up. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, everybody wants victory, saints. Everybody wants victory. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, the scripture says, thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So being a child of God, by virtue of our faith in Jesus Christ, places us on the winning side of every battle. The winning side of every battle. If you want to be on the winning team in every battle in life, you are on it if you are in Christ Jesus in the, in the family of God. Amen? If God says in his word that we always get the victory through Christ Jesus, it's settled. If God says that we always win in Christ Jesus, how, who, who going to argue with that? He's not talking about how you feel. He's not talking about the natural circumstances. He's not talking about what you bring by yourself into the fray. He's talking about what you have in Christ Jesus. He said he always causes us, always. That means not sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. That means always, in every encounter, 
God says he leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we know, saints, that we as the heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus get everything that Jesus himself got. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 16, 17 says this from the King James Version. For the Spirit himself bears with, with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. So God is saying in that scripture that, that, that you are an heir. That should be shouting material for most people. Most people hear that and it's like, that's just a, a word, empty word. If Bill Gates walked up in here and said, I have, I have a minute in my will, and I show you a copy of it, that you are now an heir of my fortune. Man, you'll tear those bitches up trying to shout. Because Bill Gates, uh, one of those rich folks, came in here and showed you that you are now an heir of his fortune. But here, Almighty God, the owner of everything, Amen? The ones who guarantee that we triumph in every situation says that we are heirs of his and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And that everything that Jesus got, everything he got, that you're going to get it too. Amen? When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Gospels, the Father made a declaration over him that we should by faith vicariously receive as a declaration over us. You see, this declaration that God made over Jesus is a declaration of victory for us over poverty, over sickness, over death, and over all the lies and all the works of the devil. Amen? Now this is what he said, Mark 1, 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It doesn't seem like a lot, huh? But God is telling Jesus. He, he make a declaration over Jesus' life for everybody to hear. They say, you are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Now you got to tweak your mind from 3D to 4D to see that when God tells Jesus that he is well pleased with Jesus because we are now in Christ Jesus, guess who else? by virtue of Jesus' position, is well-pleasing to God, too. Amen. We are, amen? amen? If you came in here today, or if you listen to this message somewhere, and you think that you are a loser, you better consider the source. Who told you you're a loser? Who told you you're a failure? Who told you that you're not going to ever get over in life? I guarantee you it wasn't God because God tells you in his word that you're heir of God. You're joint heir of Jesus. Amen? When God came to Adam in the garden and they were hiding, he said, who told you you were naked? Who told him he was naked? Anybody know? Okay. Satan. Amen? Satan. Who said that? You said that? I praise God. I ain't got my money on me. I was going to give you some money, Margaret. Praise God. Praise. Saved by... Not having, I was going to pay you for, for getting the answer right. Praise, we're not being scared to say it. Satan told them they were naked. If God told you that you were a loser, I mean, if, if, if you heard the word that you were a loser, it wasn't God, amen? amen. It, was, it, was, it was Satan, man. In 1 John 5, 4, New, uh, the King James Version says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You see, daily maintenance of this truth is very essential for the times, especially for the times that we're living in and the challenges that we're facing in our lives today. We're facing stuff today, man, that we never had to face before. You're going through stuff that you never dreamed that you have to do with before. But God says, I got you covered, man. He said, nothing surprises me that I prepared you for this. And I prepared you to stand. I prepared you to persevere. I prepared you to go through, amen, and to always be triumphant no matter what is coming across your plate. It doesn't matter how small it is. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what your mind say. God says, I have prepared you for this, 
and it might be bigger than anything you've ever imagined, and it will make, make the normal people faint, fall away. But I always causes you to triumph. Amen? Amen. So, saints, in order to maintain this attitude of victory, it's going to take a regular diet of the Word of God. You just can't come in and eat on Sunday. Could you imagine if, if Christians only ate real food, carnal food, you know what I mean? Bacon and eggs and, and chicken, fried chicken and, and ribs and, 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 and noodles and rice, if they only ate on Sunday. But we have a bunch of skinny folks running around here, amen? You would have not one obese person in church. Now, gluttony would be like, where can I go to stick on somebody? Because these folks only eat food on Sunday. But Christians eat all the time, naturally. Some of them eat three or four meals a day. They bought into the story, the, 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 the narrative that if you eat, the more meals you eat, the more weight you lose. That might be true, but you can't be eating the stuff that most people be eating, amen, to do that. Man, you're going to have to have a consistent, regular diet of the Word of God. You got to eat words like you eat food. Amen? You need to have a consistent prayer life. It can't just be on Sunday, coming to here on Sunday, looking like you're religious, looking like you've been doing it, and, 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 and you haven't been. Because you know a tree by its fruit. Coming here empty-handed without somebody. I, I brought somebody last year. I, I sowed a seed. I told somebody about Jesus last year. I was talking to people. What about today? Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Every moment that we're living and breathing, we should be expressing God's glory. We should be extending this life that God has given to us to somebody that crosses our pathway, not just for our own benefit, not just for their benefit, but for the glory of God. Amen? You never know who's connected to that person that you won't say something to. You never know. That was a lady years ago. Years ago, there was a lady who would walk past me and my friend, my partner on, the, on our job. And this lady didn't know us from a hill of beans, but she would pass out these tracks. Every time she would pass out these tracks, Jesus love you. Every night, it was a little overtime job. Jesus love you. Every night. And it went on and my, my, my friend was like, I don't need this, but I'm looking at these things and reading this stuff. And I'm saying, man, gee, God loves me. But God is calling me and God is using her. And she saw that I was reading this stuff and she started bringing me books. Full gospel men's fellowship books of miracles and men serving and praying to God. And she saw I was reading that. She started bringing, she brought me a Bible, man. She started doing all kinds of stuff. And she was Catholic and she filled with the Holy Ghost. And she had no idea what she sparked. She has no idea that that was a catalyst for me to begin to seek God, for me to find my plan, God's plan and purpose for my life, because she crossed my pathway and she was obedient to not sit on the word of God, but to share it with somebody else without a preacher having to tell her to do it, without anybody else having to be with her to do it. But because she loved God and she was a praying lady, and she knew God wanted people. Not everybody, my friend, who's going on to be with the Lord, and I hope he got saved. Who knows what he received Jesus at some point in his life. But I did. And so you're not responsible for the response of the people, but you're responsible not to sit on it like a fat rat. Nobody's a fat rat up in here, amen? Don't be coming to me talking about pastor calling me a fat rat. No, I'm talking, I'm not calling you a fat rat, amen? <laughs> I say, like, don't sit down on the word of God that God has given you and not share it with somebody. Amen. Because somebody is going to see their maker real soon. And they need to know, man, that this is the way that we should go. Amen. So we need a consistent prayer life. We need quality fellowship with like-minded believers. You need to fellowship with like-minded believers. We have fellowship. Everybody got, a lot of people got a lot of friends. I, I know the, the, the more God raises you up, the more he separates you from a lot of people that you are accustomed to being around. But a lot of people still got a lot of friends, but make sure they're like-minded. And keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. We studied that last week, Jude 20. You know, keep praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourself in the love of God. You see, this will ensure that this faith that God 
has given us, this faith that he says gets us to victory is ever present and is ready to perform in every situation that life presents to us. Every situation that life presents to you, the faith that's deposited in your spirit will perform and give you the victory in that situation. Amen. It has to work by love. Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. You see, faith that works is going to be faith that's built on the love of God. Faith that built on the belief, not on how much I love God, but how much God loves me. How much God loves me. It's more, it's more important for us to realize that God really loves us, man. He loves us. He loves us no matter how we miss it, no matter how we get convicted in church, how we miss church. God still loves us. Amen. And he wants to keep ourselves in that position of love. You see, everything that we do for God, every word that we speak for God, every prayer that we pray, every activity that we participate in, everything as believers that we are engaged in. All of our giving included has to be done based on the belief that God loves us. Amen. And that our faith that we say we have is not just in our own self. It's faith in Christ Jesus. The faith in Christ Jesus is the faith that really pleases God. Because only Jesus could please God the way God needs to be pleased. Amen. The father needs to be pleased. Amen. So, I don't know if anybody getting this today, but this message, if you listen to it, if you get some of it, no matter who you are and where you go to church, or whether you come back here or not, or whether you do come back, this message today will build you up, and it will propel you to victory in everything that comes against you in the coming week. Amen? Your mindset on the declaration that God has made over you will determine whether you win or lose, even when things happen that you didn't plan for. This word, if you receive it, will be the springboard into your victory. Amen? This word will help to transform your mind into seeing yourself in the image that Jesus gained for you, that God wants you to embrace, and that God wants you to walk in. He wants you to walk in this mindset. He wants you to walk in this attitude. He wants you to walk in this confidence of believing, of trusting, of seeing him move, of expecting him to move in every situation, in every circumstance, of knowing that no matter what happens, no matter what the doctors say, no matter how you feel, no matter what your mama and them say, your friends or your haters say, God says, that you are well pleasing in his sight. Amen? That you are his beloved child. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, and read this as we, as we land this, talking about the pattern that was set in the beginning. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Every time I read that, I see all kind of revelation that, that, that tries to pull me off onto a rabbit trail. But I'm not going to go there today. Notice that God says he want to replenish the earth. Replenish. That means that something was here before it wasn't here. So science and the Bible might not be at odds. Amen. Because there was something here before it was, wasn't here. You see, we see Adam in Genesis, and Adam's, in essence, was the first Christ, the first anointed one. The blessing that God placed on him was the catalyst that released 
that blessed environment that the Garden of Eden is seen as. It was a perfect place, a blessed place, the Garden of Eden. Adam was the Christ. He was the master of it. He was God's covenant head over that, redemptive head over that. Amen? You see, Eden in Genesis was the earthly duplication of heaven. There's a scripture that it says that there was gold there, that there was no sickness there. There was no fear there. Amen? No depression was there. No death was there in Eden. An earthly representative representation of heaven. None of the manifestations that began to permeate the earth after Satan took over and administered the curse of poverty, sickness, and death was there. The devil's stuff wasn't there until he came in in Genesis 3. He came in, he tempted Adam, Eve, and stole away our right, his right, as the Christ of God's creation, as the covenant head of God's creation. The devil became the God of this world system. The God of this world system, the world system that we see now, the, that we participate in now, seven pillars that we're not going to go there right now and deal with. The devil is ahead of that. You're working the devil's system out there. If you're working out there somewhere and wherever you're working, you're working in the devil's system. Nine times out of ten, you're working in his system. And God has, he has some power for you to take that system to a whole, in a whole different direction. And we see that Jesus was the last Adam. Amen? Because when Adam fell, because of his sin, he fell from the image of God and fell into the image of his new daddy, the devil. So everybody who's not in Christ Jesus, this is a hard one for people to take because they like people, man. I like my friend. I like my sister and my brother. But they don't like Jesus. Everybody who is not in Christ, they reflect the image of the devil. I don't care how much we like them. Amen? So this Jesus, the last Adam, he came and restored God's legal authority to reestablish this blessed environment of Eden for us to live in here on this earth. Adam reigned over Eden with words. With words. Say, how did Adam know how to name everything? How did he know how to do those things that they say he did? Called everything what they are called even to this day. Because God whispered in his spirit, amen, and told him what to call these things. So Adam ruled and reigned. He didn't go out and toil and labor and try to cultivate all those luscious fruit and, and vegetables and all the other stuff that was growing in Eden. Adam did it with the words that God gave him, that he heard from God, amen? And we see in Jesus' life that Jesus reigned over it. The Bible says he went about, Acts 10 through 8, he went about doing good, killing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. He was anointed by the Holy Ghost with power. And so he reigned over and destroyed all the works of the devil with what? His words. With his words. And when the disciples, the ones who hung with him, Every day for three years, they saw that there was something special about this dude, even though he was in a flesh and blood body. And he say he was a son of God. And everything that he did was absolutely validating the fact that he was connected to something that's not of this earth. Because he was healing folks that couldn't be healed. He was delivering folks that couldn't be delivered. He was delivering goods to people that couldn't get goods delivered to him any other kind of way. They knew that was something special about this dude. Amen? And so they said, Master, we've been noticing that you get up early every morning and you pray. So teach us how to pray. We want to be able to do what you do. Teach us how to pray too so we can plug in to this Wi-Fi that you plug it into so the resources that flow in through your life into people's lives will flow into our lives too. 
And what did Jesus say? No, that's not just, that's for me only. He didn't say that, did he? A lot of us would have said, no, that's for me and my four no more. No, he said, okay, this is how I want you to pray, amen? In Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, after this manner, therefore pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Everybody know that prayer, man. Most people, every religion, Christian religion, know that prayer. I think even Jehovah's Witnesses might pray that prayer. I'm not sure. I try to pray with Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't want to pray because they're scared the Holy Ghost might get involved. But I pray for them anyway. You know, you come to my house. And you want to preach to me about Watchtower? I say, no, you got to hold on. Let's pray. No, I don't want to. We don't want to. No, you're going to have to pray. No, we're leaving. I said, okay, let's leave. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray with you anyway. On my property, you're going to get prayed for. Amen? amen? If you don't want to get prayed for, don't come into my house. Amen? Stay across the street, and I pray for you from a distance. But if you come into my presence, I'm going to hook up to the Wi-Fi. Amen? amen. <laughs> Y'all need to be that way too, man. <laughs> you know, Y'all know I'm telling the truth. You know I'm telling the truth, don't you? <laughs> That's why I need somebody praying for me, man. I'm not going to hook up with nobody who don't pray. Amen? If you want to hang out with pastors, you're going to have to be a praying person because you got to be able to defend yourself and cover his back at the same time. Amen? I had an old lady once say, Pastor, you're a pastor now, you know, and don't be dependent on them people to pray for you. She went to Crenshaw Christian Center, old lady. She's still my neighbor. I said, what you mean? People are supposed to pray for their pastor. I said, no. They won't pray. They're carnal. You pray for yourself. I say, I'll pray for myself. Yeah, you pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. You cover yourself. Get your wife, your family. You pray for yourself. Cover yourself. I say, okay. But you still have to teach people to pray. You have to encourage them to pray because they got to pray for their families too. Amen. 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 I found out when my, for my wife transitioned how, how people really didn't pray in this church. The first words I heard from here. The first words out of the mouth of one of the people that we stay up at night praying for, going to visit and taking care of. The first word to me was, you're not the only one going through something. Get over it. I said, you got to be kidding me. It's only been three hours. And you saying that to me? And I have to love you? See, it's not my love. I can still love him because it's not my love. It's God's love. If it was my love, I wouldn't be loving them right now, amen? But because it's not my love, the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost that is given to us. When I received this assignment from God, I had a visitation from him because we, we were starting with a lot of people who were very hurt, very disenchanted, and I didn't know why God did this. God baptized me in love. He came and he soaked me like a sponge. Got a sponge in the sink. It was soaked with water. He soaked me with this love so thoroughly. I said, what is, what is this feeling? I never felt love like this before. He said, I just, I love you this deeply and I want you to express this love to these people because they need love. If it was not for that love, I wouldn't be able to stand here even to this day, man. Love will sustain you, man. It'll, it'll fortify your faith. It'll give your faith the muscle to be able to do whatever you need to do in life. Amen? And if you say you love your sister and your brother, you're not inviting them. You're not telling them about Jesus. You haven't received this love yet. If you've got kids who say, who give you all kinds of excuses, and you're not on their case because you don't want to rattle their cage or step on eggs around them, you're not flowing in this love yet. Amen? The love of God is not going to take any prison. It's not going to step back because of somebody's attitude. The love of God realizes that down the road, there's a cliff that they're headed towards, a blind cliff that they're coming to and they don't even see it. And that you see it, but you won't say anything because you're scared that they're going to be offended or they're going to leave you and not talk to you. I won't let you see the grandkids or whatever. And you won't grab them and snatch them back. You better snatch them with the love of God, man. Read Jude. You say some of them you snatch out of the fire with fear. Some of them you love. Some of you have to snatch with fear, man. Some people need to be have the hell scaled out of them. And God will do that, amen? God's the only one that can do that. I saw Jamie Foxx uh, talking on the radio, TV last night. Jamie Foxx, he said he almost died. I 
I'm still waiting for the testimony. He said he didn't, he didn't tell nobody what the problem was, but he thanked his family for covering and not letting people know what was wrong with him. But he almost died, and he's glad to be able to talk right now. I'm waiting for the testimony to come back out. Amen? There is a day coming in everybody's life when they're going to come face to face with whether I really, really need God or whether I really, really can do this in my own strength. Amen? And we want to make sure that, man, our loved ones and the ones that we care about, they have this disconnection. Amen? But this prayer, this prayer that Jesus taught these people is not intended to be a rote prayer like we religious folks teach us. A rote prayer where you got to say the same words that he used right here over and over and over again, the way they taught us in Methodist and Catholic churches and Baptist churches. That's not the way it should be done, amen? This is an outline that we are to use that reaches absolutely into that fourth dimension. See, the tone and the tense should change because the timeline has changed. There, when Jesus taught them this prayer, Jesus was on his way to the cross. Now, in these days that we're living in now, we are living in the finished works of Christ after the cross. He has taken care of everything. He has defeated every enemy. He's provided all of our needs. He's healed every sickness. Amen? He has done it all already. Amen? So God says, I don't have time to go to all the scriptures, but you have to take my word on this, the ones who haven't heard it. We have been made kings and priests to God. We all have. God said we have been made kings and priests unto God. One of the scriptures that Sister Margaret read before she prayed this morning for Revelations 5. We have been made, his people have been called, and we have each one been made kings and priests to God. Amen? And what does a king do? How does a king reign like Adam did, like Jesus did? Job 22, 28 says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established. Kings speak. They don't go out and work. They say. And things happen because they're kings. Amen. Ecclesiastes 8 4 says, Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say to him, What are you doing? Saints, this prayer is designed as an outline that we can use. You don't have to use it, I'm gonna take my word for it. But if you use it, you're going to see some changes. Where you can go before the Father. You can go into the courtroom, as it were, of heaven. And you can make declarations. Declarations of what Jesus has already accomplished for you. Declarations and watch the transfer from the fourth dimension manifest in this third dimensional life that we're living in right now. Saints, you have the word of God on this. And your mind is being transformed to walk into this realization of what we have right now. Amen? Amen? It's time for us to trust God and stop looking at ourselves as being regular people under the circumstances. We're not under the circumstances. God said we are kings and priests unto our God. So our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You need healing? Revelation 5.12 tell you where to draw from. Revelation 5.12, all those benefits. Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that I'm healed today. Father, I thank you that all my financial needs are supplied today, that there's no lack, that I might not know the source of the, the income, but it's here because you have enriched me in what Jesus Christ did for me. 
Father, I thank you that my children are saved, that they are blessed. I mean, whatever your needs are, whatever you desire God to manifest in your life, begin to stand up and boldly decree with a thank you because it's already yours. Amen? It's time out for begging. It's time out for making excuses. It's time out for being the way other people are. The classic example is David. I look at King David. I'm not going to go there and close the Bible. King David is a good example, man. He went against this giant Goliath. And Goliath was huge. He was formidable. The whole army of Israel was hiding from him. But David had a relationship with God. David was a king before they had known him as king. And so David decreed to Goliath what the deal was. And God backed up his decree. And God defeated Goliath. Amen. So if anybody in this house is dealing with anything, anybody that's dealing with something, and you're a child of God, decree your victory. Make a declaration today of the victory that you want to see happen for you today. Whatever your situation is, and everybody is different, declare it. Stop being a silent religious church goer. Open your royal mouth and decree what God wants to give into your life and receive it in Jesus' name. Thank God for his words, saints. Amen. Father, I thank you and praise you for the word. Thank you that you've given us a word that will take us to another level, level of manifesting your glory. We pray, Father, for evidence for evidence to be seen in people's lives, for them to dare to open their mouths in faith and to say in agreement with the word of God the things that you've already given them and to thank you and to receive these things manifested in their lives today. Lord, we pray for everyone here that they will have a heart and willingness to watch you perform these things for them. We thank you for bodies being healed. We thank you for supernatural financial increase coming to those who are asking you and seeking for it. We pray for peace, sound mind. We pray for family reconciliations that children are reconciled with their parents and they're reconciled with you. We pray for neighborhoods, communities, and cities to see the glory of God being revealed in their midst so they can run from darkness and run to the to powerful light of your salvation. And Father, we just bless you. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. And we just glorify you for this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God, saints. Amen. Thank God for his word. Glory to God. Amen. Anybody want to? Get saved, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I stopped doing that for a long time. I, I stopped doing that when we first started the church. I stopped doing it. I stopped doing it. I said, I'm not going to do it no more because it don't, it don't work. And as soon as I said that, some lady came up at the church. Pastor, you, you got to ask for people to get saved and join the church because I was just waiting. But when she found out I wasn't going to do it no more, then she, she wanted to do it. And then she joined the church became a good member. So if you want to want to be a member of this church, just let me know. We have a little class. We have a little orientation. And that's all it takes. It's easy to get to be a member here. Well, right now, saints, we're going to honor God with our tithe, offering, first fruit seed. Amen.